Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones? I'd like to start by uh, giving apologies for Alec Rowley, who is unwell this morning and can't make the meeting. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. That is agreed. Agenda item two is a round table evidence session on staff absenteeism in local authorities as part of the committee's 2020-21 pre-budget scrutiny. The committee took evidence on workforce planning in local authorities last year and today's session will build on some of the themes that were explored in that session. I welcome you all here today but perhaps we could go around the table and introduce ourselves Starting with myself, and then I'll go round to my right. My name is James Dornan, MSP, and I'm the convener of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Good morning. My name is Nikki Bridal. I'm Chief Executive at Clatman and Council. Good morning. My name is Stuart Crick, I'm Strategic Director at Clatman and Council. Andy Whiteman, MSP for Lothian. Joanna Baxter, I'm Unison's Head of Local Government Bargaining. Alexander Stewart, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Drew Duffy, GMB Scotland, Senior Organiser for Public Services. Graham Simpson, MSP for Central Scotland. I'm Sharon McKenzie. I'm here on behalf of the Society of Personnel and Development Scotland. I'm currently its president. I'm Kenneth Gibson, MSP for Cunningham North. I am Paul McGowan, Head of HR, East Ayrshire Council. Annabelle Ewing, MSP for Cowden Beath Constituency. And to my left, we have the official report, researchers and the clerks who will provide the committee with background support. This is a roundtable evidence session, which means I very much welcome a flow of discussion and exchanges of different views, and you should feel free to engage directly with each other. However, it would be very helpful if you could direct your comments through me and the chair, and if you wish to say anything, just try to catch my eye or the clerks. Before I invite questions, can I just... Uh, Remind members, but also the other people here, here today, you do not need to press a button to speak. It will come on automatically. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start off by asking a fairly simple question and really the reason why we're here today. And that is if anybody has any ideas about the reasons for the wide variation in absence rates uh, between local authorities, which we've seen can be quite stark. Does anybody wish to start on that one? Joanna. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I thought it might be useful, um, as we haven't submitted a, a paper, if I can take you through some of Unison's experiences with regards to sickness absence management across the 32 local authorities in Scotland. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I think the first thing to say is that uh, all of the available data uh, out there with regards to the number of days lost through sickness absence uh, do not reflect the full picture of what we see on the ground. And the reason for that is that there are significant differences um, across the local authorities in terms of um, what data is actually collected, uh, what's recorded uh, as sickness absence, um, the makeup of uh, their workforce, uh, the level of HR our support available uh, to support people uh, returning to work and also the different policies and procedures which apply uh, across each local authority. Uh, in Unison's experience, um, it, uh, sickness absence management uh, should be used as a supportive mechanism to uh, help individuals uh, return to work and where we find that that is the case, uh, there are lower levels of sickness absence, uh, fewer days lost to sickness absence uh, and fewer uh, disciplinary uh, uh, disciplinaries uh, taken as a result of sickness absence. Where that is not the case and procedures are used as in a punitive manner, we see higher levels of sickness absence, um, uh, higher levels of sickness absence review meetings and disciplinary proceedings um, taking place as a result of sickness absence. We believe that is both time consuming for management for the trade unions and uh, also has a negative effect on employees. And one example that I would provide for that uh, is our experience in uh, Glasgow City Council, where uh, prior to the uh, most recent administration taking uh, over, we found that there was quite a punitive system in place and um, with the new administration taking over, uh, we found that the approach, whilst the procedure itself has not considerably differed, uh, the approach taken in terms of uh, staff who are absent is of a much more supportive uh, manner than existed in the past. 
uh, one thing that we have seen uh, recently is that um, triggers for review are getting shorter. Review periods for absence themselves are also getting shorter. And in every case where we find an employer has altered their sickness absence procedures in the last three years, they have done so only in a manner that triggers intervention at an earlier stage of the process. Um, some local authorities have uh, uh, moved to an, um, an entirely metric-based uh, system, for example, the Bradford factor. Uh, we would say that that is the opposite of a people-centred management programme, that in fact that is entirely the opposite of that, and it's management by algorithm, and you can see that in places like East Renfrewshire Leisure, for example. With regards to FOI data for the last three years, that indicates that the most common reason for sickness absence um, across local authorities that trigger any sort of review process is mental health absences. Um, and in our experiences, um, managers uh, very often feel more confident and capable of putting in place um, uh, uh, procedures for supporting individuals where they have a physical um, disability, for example, and find it more difficult to put in place uh, supportive mechanisms for individuals suffering from mental health uh, issues. That is also not helped by the degree of change, organisational change, which is taking place across local authorities at the present time. Um, and when we've FOI'd councils on how many uh, staff have been taken through absence management procedures, a significant number of them have actually returned saying that they do not hold that uh, data centrally. Um, that applies in Midlothian, Aberdeenshire, Argyll and Butte and Western Bartonshire. Additionally, we believe there is a significant problem with presenteeism. Um, so uh, individuals using, individuals um, uh, attending work when actually they should be off on sick leave. That's driven by uh, the lowering of triggers. Um, so individuals fearing uh, that a review period would be put in place if they actually took the time off that they needed. Um, that leads to longer absences in the long term because um, individuals are attending um, when they should be off sick. The pressure on staff to deliver and concerns about job uh, stability. Pull you to close, Joanna, because there's a lot okay. of people want Thank to come Thank you very in. much. Just, just on um, two of the things, I think. One is that would Unison not have a role in at least trying to persuade councils that they should have best practice used or there should be some sort of uniform uh, way of, of reporting absences because this clearly doesn't seem to be working? Absolutely, and, and we certainly do that um, in all the negotiations that we uh, engage in across all 32 local authorities. We use best practice um, from across the country. Uh, the difference, the difficulty that we find in those negotiations is uh, the level of HR support available in councils and the funding available for that. Um, one thing that I would say is that funding certainly has an impact on this uh, issue, um, not just in terms of HR support, but also the level of change that's being experienced within councils um, and the level of um, uh, jobs that have been lost within local authorities. 15,000 jobs have been lost in local authorities over the last five years. So you're expecting the existing cohort of staff to do more with less on an almost consistent basis uh, and councils being ever more restricted in the funding available and how they choose to spend that. I'm sure there's comments would like Kenny and then... Yes, it's just <clears throat> with regard to the, the data, I think uh, 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 what Ms. Baxter has said is uh, very significant in terms of variations in data. And I, I noticed that when we got the, the SPICE um, information with regard to all the local authorities over the last uh, eight years, what struck me, um, not just the fact that Click Manninshire has the highest and East Ayrshire has the lowest in the most recent year, 2017 18 but Clark Manager in 2012-13 had the highest uh, absences of non-teaching staff at 21.06. But the following year, it went down to 7.92, which then became the lowest in Scotland. And then it's become the highest in Scotland again. So I'm just wondering whether or not there has been a change in how you actually record these figures or what these figures represent and how there has been a change. Because we want to make sure we're comparing apples with apples and not apples with oranges. <coughs> Thank you for that question. It's, it's one of the things that um, is, is something that's stretched us a, a little bit within the council. We, um, up until about four years ago, had what was basically a manual recording system. 
So about four years ago, we implemented a, a full HR system, which has really refined the recording of all our absence data. So I think what you're probably seeing is perhaps in history, an element of under recording for sickness absence was coming through for the council. Um, what I would say is though now we are super squeaky clean in terms of everything, every single absence that we, we record. I do think in terms of your point about com uh, comparability of, of the approaches across councils, I think there's still quite a bit of variability in terms of how these things are recorded, even for the benchmarking framework. So, um, I mean, it, you would still want to deal with the, the substantive issue, but obviously that is a consideration too in terms of the apples and pears um, comparison. Done through COSLA, for example, to ensure standardised measurements? There are definitions that come out through the, um, the local government benchmarking framework, but even within those parameters, there are different applications of those definitions. Um, I'm not actually um, an HR specialist, you'll appreciate that, and I'm sure other colleagues may wish to comment on that, but we, we are aware that there are certain things that we, we include everything, and we've just been having a, co a conversation with colleagues, actually, about that, so we include things like um, leavers data, we include things like maternity absences, um, we're aware that that isn't the case necessarily across all other councils. Yeah. Sean. Just as a, as a follow-on to, to Nikki's comments in relation to how absence is captured and recorded, I think it's fair to say that the, the local government benchmark framework um, guidance is, is fairly clear in terms of what should be included and what should not be included in the calculations. But we do have a sense that perhaps that is not being applied um, comprehensively and diligently across all councils, and it may just come down to local interpretation of what is said in the guidance as opposed to trying not to, um, to capture all of the... Um, the absence data, but it's something that we were speaking about prior to coming into the meeting today, and it's certainly something that in my role, um, acting on behalf of SPDS, I can pick up with the improvement service, and we do intend to do that, because I think it really is important that if we have a set of benchmarking information, that we are comparing like with like, because otherwise it becomes quite difficult to interpret what's really happening across the 32 councils. Okay, thank you, Paul, and then Alexander. Yes, Chair, maybe just to, to expand on that, I think one of the issues is, you know, while we do have the guidance uh, nationally to follow, uh, the systems we're using are all different, so most councils uh, are probably uh, recording sickness absence through the payroll and management information systems. We do not have a system that's, you know, pan-Scotland that everyone's using to record absence. Uh, we are using different systems. Uh, I don't think that's an excuse for data being different, eh, but I think it does add to the complexity eh, of the situation. Eh, within those systems, and certainly from my own council's experience, eh, we record lots of different information there. We break down absence in different ways in terms of reasons, you know, and, and that, again, eh, is for each individual authority to record eh, the complexity of absence eh, as they see fit. Eh, we have, you know, high... We have areas such as kind of mental health, personal stress, that we're all pulling together. Uh, but I don't think any of the 32 councils would have, you know, 14 or 20 definitions of absence that they use consistently across the council. So it is a complex area, uh, but I think the complexity of the, the methods we're using to record that add to that. OK, thank you. Alexander? You've all identified how complex the area really is, but we've had evidence in other uh, sessions from local government and uh, individuals within authorities about the, the ageing workforce, uh, the, the reduction that has happened over the last few years in the workforce and in the majority of councils. Uh, and when we're looking at sickness absence, uh, a number of you have potentially long-term sickness uh, to contend with, uh, and one or two individuals may then skew the whole process, uh, depending on how that, that is recorded. So, so can I ask about how, how you're managing that with, with the, the knowledge that you have an ageing population, a reducing workforce, uh, and uh, the potential to have a number of uh, long-term individuals uh, who uh, may well give you uh, more information uh, on, on that level uh, that, then, that then gives you uh, a priority uh, going forward and, and how you manage that, because is that being managed in a similar way across the local authorities that we have? Uh, Nicky, you wanted to come in uh, and then 
we'll come back on that. Okay. Um, the, the point I wanted to make was that um, we made a conscious decision actually not to include within our submission the issue of um, the comparability because we're aware it's an ongoing issue and I do agree with Sharon's comment. It's something that we feel we need to be working on. For us, the, the more important thing is that we're focused on the substantive issue of, of effectively managing absence and supporting our employee cohorts. So I think uh, I just wanted to make that point because I think it's quite important. The comparability I can absolutely appreciate is very important for the committee's purposes however we, we still need to deal with a substantive issue because we are seeing increase in absence levels surely but a, there has to be some sort of way that you are dealing with your own issues in the same way across the country that can be reported across the country i'm not saying everybody does exactly the same thing mm -hmm. but it must be a reporting mechanism that can be used to make sure that the committee uh, and and therefore the parliament gets the uh, information that they need to make sure things go right uh, graham you wanted to come in yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I appreciate that councils are using different methods and perhaps they shouldn't be, perhaps it should be more uniform. But nevertheless, <clears throat> some councils have done better than others. Um, and, and your own council, Nikki, I'm not picking on you because I know you're quite new to the job, has, not, has really not done very well. Um, the absence levels have, have rocketed since 2010. But in other councils, that's not been the case. I mean, East, East Ayrshire has gone down. Uh, so, I mean, really the reason for this session was we were looking at these raw figures, I accept they're raw figures, and we're wondering, well, what's going on, what's going on in East Ayrshire? What are they doing that Clack Manager and others uh, are not doing? And, and could we sort of roll out what, what's going on in East Ayrshire and others where, where they've seen a reduction. Could we roll out those practices across the country? Okay, yeah, briefly then, Joanna. Um, just make a brief response. Thank you, convener. Um, I think that's a perfectly valid question, and I, and I can understand that question, um, having reviewed the data. Um, the, the issue for Clark Manager is that, as I say, Probably four years ago when we introduced the new system, we now have a much fuller and more accurate reporting of our, of our absences from all, for all different reasons. That's actually allowing us to understand the nature of the absences far better. Um, I think um, if you look at our policy framework and the level of support that is afforded to our staff, it compares very favourably with, with those arrangements that are in place in other councils. Um, we are, one of the things that we're doing is um, we're actually looking uh, with health colleagues just now at our local health demographic data because um, a significant proportion of the council's staff is from, from the local area. We are aware anecdotally that there have been increase in GP referrals. We're also aware anecdotally that there have been increases in kind of chronic um, conditions for a number of people within our area. So we're actually looking beyond the, the sort of traditional bounds of the policy framework and the support mechanisms to get a better understanding and thinking, are there other interventions and supports that we could be putting in place beyond those traditional approaches? Okay, uh, I'll let you in first, Drew, and then Joanna wants to come in. Um, I'm not going to repeat exactly what Joanna said earlier on because I think she's spot on. But I guess the reason we're here is to maybe give a bit more data about the, the, the real life stories behind those figures. So I think there's a big problem about how local government feel, workers feel valued, and that does vary consistent, inconsistently across the local authority. So some just examples are a lot of our members in the GMB in particular are, are kind of the low paid bottom four or five scales across local government. These are the workers that are doing two or three jobs just to make ends meet. So they don't have the same rest time. They don't work Monday to Friday, eight till five. They are working six, seven days a week, split shifts. So they're tired, they're exhausted. Even the jobs that they're in, they're doing the work of two or three people So because they, they, they've lost colleagues and they've not been replaced. Um, in some councils, we've got a, 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 a worker who works in the, the kitchen in the afternoon for the local government, gets paid the living wage, or the, the Scottish local government living wage, then she finishes her shift, she walks down the corridor, she's working for a private company, and she's losing over a pound an hour. So within the same building, she's going back 10 years in pay, because she's, but she's working the same place because her employer changes, she just changes her, her, her penny. That, how does that worker feel valued at the end of that working week? And they're, they're not doing that by choice, that's a necessity. 
Um, we've run a recent survey across pupil support assistance in Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire. Ninety percent of the people that respond to that say they've, they've suffered either violent or physical or verbal attacks in work. Um, in Aberdeenshire just recently, 75% of those that were reported never got any feedback about that. So again, how do these, well, these workers are being bit, chewed at, at swallowed, at, spat at, and verbally abused. One had a scarf put around her neck and was choked and had to fight that scarf off. That was reported, no feedback on that. So how does that worker feel valued? That affects their mental health, their physical health. Um, so these are just some, some, I could give you many, but it's just to give you the committee an idea of these are some of the, the real life stories. Not take us into the way that different councils are dealing with HR issues then. <coughs> you know, obviously there'd be some councils you would think they would deal with that better than the councils that you're obviously talking about in situations be, like this. To be fair to the city and shire, I think both uh, the three trade unions involved have sat with us. They're, they're both, I think the councils have accepted, look, that's not on. These figures, these real life stories are not acceptable. So we are, we, we were looking to reform the whole reporting process, the training, but fundamentally it comes down to, particularly in the PSAs, people support assistance, sorry, trying to use jargon, um, is the demand for help from children is on the increase while well, the funding for support for children is on the decrease. So that could only go, this is, this is the result of that direct attack on funding and education. Something for the councils to deal with when they're talking about their HR issues as well then. Can I just ask, sorry, but you can come back to stuff. The, the, what areas within the council services are the absence rates higher? And you know, is there any particular reason you can think of for that? You know, care services, for example, Sean? I think that would um, probably be different across different councils and there are probably um, pockets of our workforce where there might be commonalities. Um, you know, within education, um, you know, teachers absence, as you see from the, the statistics that you have before you, teachers absence um, generally is, is reporting better than non-local government employees absence over the piece. But there's a creeping trend amongst teaching um, teaching workforce um, for increasing levels of absence in different organisations, different councils. And much of that has been reported quite um, widely and extensively in the press in relation to increased workloads, the pressures of the job, some of the issues mentioned by um, Drew Duffy in relation to violent, <coughs> violence and aggression in schools affecting not just the teacher workforce but non-teaching workforces as well. But across the local government workforce, and if you, if you take teachers out of the mix, um, I think generally um, you may find pockets of absence occurring in particular parts of the organisation where they're at the front line, um, perhaps as, as my colleague Drew also said, where they're delivering frontline services in, in what were perhaps manual um, and traditional areas of work, so they're and, you know, our refuse collectors, our street sweepers, <coughs> and those who are involved in working in all sorts of weather um, can often um, experience high levels of sickness absence, generally on the shorter term absences, you know, so that they're affected by colds and flu and musculoskeletal type issues. But I'm not sure we could say absolutely across every council that we're all the same in terms of our <coughs> peaks um, in terms of types of absences within particular parts of the organisation. That yeah. data would be available, um, there's no doubt about that, and we could each speak on, you know, on behalf of our own councils in terms of where the different pressure points are. Okay, thank you. Kenny wanted to come in and then I want to... Yeah, I'm just surprised at what Mr McKenzie said there, actually, because according to the figures we got from Spice, the, the level of absenteeism among teachers is the lowest in the, of the last eight year, in the last eight years, which contradicts what she's just said in terms of actually increasing. But one of the things that's pointed out is we've heard about different measurements, but the Accounts uh, Commission, its annual uh, Local Government in Scotland Challenges and Performance publication, said starkly that if uh, councils with high absence levels could reduce these to be in line with the top eight performing councils, they would gain the equivalent staff time of 730 full-time employees. And uh, in terms of teaching, uh, 260 full-time teachers in Scotland. So although there's been a discussion about different forms of measurement, there clearly appears to be a differential across councils about how this matter is addressed. And um, <coughs> there is surely much to be gained by sharing of best practice. So I'm just wondering what's being done to ensure that we are sharing best practice um, um, to, to, to minimise these levels and, and, and ensure that we do have more staff to deliver the services we all want and need. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Paul, then Joanna. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, one of the things in terms of variability that uh, we've 
recognised is actually within the council we've got areas where absence has been managed favourably and perhaps unfavourably. One of the key things that comes through uh, in terms of our analysis is actually turnover in managers, perhaps gaps in managerial staff, and actually uh, just reflecting on uh, the comments that trade union colleagues have made, employee engagement is absolutely crucial in this. And actually, when you do have quite a churn of managers, what, ha what sometimes happens is that employee engagement, uh, there's drift a wee bit and you get uh, gaps in that. So in terms of clap manager, I, mean, I think that's one of the things that we're absolutely clear on is making sure that we've got the right managers in the right place with the right skills. We've got leadership development programme, making sure that we are um, getting that levels of employee engagement. We've... Um, uh, in the last six months, been doing quite a lot of work uh, at a senior level to make sure we're getting out there and speaking to employees. And I think that's something that we've recognised already is starting to make a difference. In terms of some of the, the, the other practice that, uh, you know, areas that we feel that we could be learning from others, we know in our, uh, our organisation that the, that the highest levels of uh, absence uh, by some margin are the 45 to 59 year olds. Uh, predominantly female, because our workforce is predominantly female. One of the areas that we feel that we, we need to do a wee bit more research and perhaps look at what other councils is doing is that cohort of staff uh, are likely to have care uh, responsibilities and other pressures in their work life. And, and what we've been seeing creeping in in the last few years in particular is stress-related absence is increasing, but it tends to be non-work-related stress. So there are other pressures going on in people's lives. So we feel that we do need to look at best practice elsewhere in Scotland in terms of carer and special leave uh, policies. And I think there's something that we could learn from others uh, in that particular field. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Chair. I suppose going back to the comments I had about the uh, East Air at the top of the league, and I think I have to be honest and say, you know, I've got no, no silver bullet that I can offer to say this is what we can do across Scotland. Uh, I think there is absolutely merit in making sure we have robust procedures, making sure they're applied consistently within councils and that's important. I don't think anybody would disagree in that. Certainly uh, from my perspective in East Ayrshire, we're very much looking at prevention. You know, we recognise people will be ill. You know, and that, that's a fact of life. Uh, our council, 75% uh, of the employees live and work in the council area, so in a sense the council is the community. So what's happening within our communities is we're seeing within our councils. Uh, looking at prevention, and again, I don't think there is one uh, answer. Uh, we try as best as we can to, to anticipate uh, particular hotspots. Uh, we do look at our, our profile, and again, to answer an earlier question, we're not seeing any particular area that's you know, a peak. Uh, an example in terms of prevention, you know, prior to Christmas and recognising that uh, Christmas can be a, a difficult time in relation to personal stress, we ramped up our service in terms of employee counselling. You know, so we, we put those measures in place to say, you know, here is the offering we can support you as a service to use uh, and we'll get some evidence back in how that, that worked. Again, working with trade union colleagues about interventions, we've recently rolled out uh, a suicide prevention scheme uh, because we have you know, an increased rate of suicide and mental health issues within our communities. So again, uh, looking to, to set up that kind of suicide prevention, uh, mental health first aiders within the workplace, and that's come down, come down very well uh, with uh, our workforce trade union colleagues uh, who see it as a valuable support. Uh, so I think, you know, we need to be looking forward. We need to try and anticipate uh, what's on the horizon. Uh, but not to be complacent in terms of our policies and procedures uh, to make sure that we are recording things consistently uh, and, and applying uh, what we say we'll do. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I do agree with um, Drew Duffy with regards to uh, the difficult issues that members are facing in the workplace, uh, particularly with regards to uh, violence in schools. That has been a particular issue facing Unison members uh, on the front line. Um, and that does have an impact on the number of days um, uh, recorded to sickness absence um, and also individuals feeling uh, at, at work. Um, 
I think one thing that I would say, though, is that um, there is a difference across uh, councils, not simply with recording, but also with regards to uh, how policies are applied with respect to intervention and at what stage intervention takes place. So this is about the trigger points. Um, so somebody's been off for uh, X number of days and um, is called to a, a conversation with their manager and the form that conversation takes, whether it's supportive or punitive. Um, what we have found is that very often there is no discretion within those policies about the application of triggers and what those triggers then lead to. There does need to be management discretion for individual issues. Um, what we have seen, though, is a number of councils um, doing uh, things which would help prevent sickness absence. So, um, for example, South Lanarkshire Council have recently introduced, uh, with dialogue and discussion with the trade unions, a menopause policy um, to support individuals who are going through the menopause. Um, that, uh, we believe, will lead to a reduction in the, the amount of time off through sickness absence that individuals would uh, be taking. Some councils have uh, introduced things along the lines of uh, domestic abuse um, and supporting individuals individuals at work when they're experiencing uh, those issues. Um, there is certainly an issue with regards to compassionate uh, leave for individuals who have caring responsibilities. This is a workforce who uh, are uh, an ageing workforce with more and more caring responsibilities uh, placed upon them and predominantly um, those fall on the, the, the female uh, workforce. Um, and then there are um, discussions around phased retirement and supporting individuals who want to stay at work and um, but perhaps need to phase into uh, retirement. So there are good examples out there. Um, I'm not sure that there are sufficient forums or dialogue taking place to share those instances of best practice. Um, but the other thing that does need to be shared is support for councils uh, with regards to occupational health service referrals, where they get their occupational health service support from um, and who provides their employee counselling. There are massive differences across the country uh, with regards to provision of those services and how robust they are, how supportive they are for employees. Okay, thank you for that. Graham, you want to come in then, Kenny? Yeah, just on that, on, on that point, I used to be a, a, a councillor in South Lanarkshire and we... Um, uh, if I was a uh, vice convener of a committee and we regularly had uh, discussions about ab absence rates um, and myself and the convener at that time would, we, we, were, we were constantly saying what do you when are you going to review your policies the figures are far too high they're still too high actually looking uh, and I know you've mentioned that the menopause uh, policy which is to be welcomed in, in South Lanarkshire um, but it's still way too high and we were encouraging them to maybe think about using outside organisations. Um, I mean, you mentioned occupational health, um, setting up maybe helplines that weren't, wasn't the council, that council employees could go to. Um, and it, it strikes me that just listening to people around the table, that doesn't appear to be any kind of forum in Scotland for sharing best practice. Um, uh, and that would be a very good idea if there was. And if there was something to come out of this, it may be something like that. So you could discuss things in far more detail. And Mr McGowan can blow his trumpet a bit more loudly than he has today. Uh, Sharon, you wanted to come in on that point. Uh, if I could, Chair, thank you. Just on that particular point in terms of, of a forum for sharing best practice, the Society of Personnel and Development, um, one of the things that is, is sort of intrinsic to its operation is that we, we do offer that supportive network across um, local councils. We have membership drawn from um, 30 of the 32 councils in Scotland, and we have a range of portfolio groups which are themed around particular topics, you know, topics that are relevant to um, the, the work of, um, of councils currently and the challenges that they face. So one of those groups is the wellbeing portfolio group, which looks holistically at a whole range of, of issues relating to, to health and wellbeing, not just the, the punitive sides of how to manage absence, but looks at all of the supportive and softer measures that, that could be applied across council, councils in Scotland. And we use that group um, very much as a, a group to, to share best practice, to learn from each other. It's a, it's a very strong networking group. 
and membership is open to all of the councils who are members of SPDS to, to be part of that group. So it's very much a, a group that, that does concentrate on sh sharing good practice and providing that, that support and networking across councils in relation to the subject matter. I'm, I'm going to let Graham come back in on this because I had uh, I was going to come in on it, but I think Graham's probably going to say this. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's all very well, but it's clearly not, not happening. Um, I mean, we've heard today and the, the, the representatives from CLAC manager um, if they're if they're aware of this, um, don't appear to be feeding into it. Um, uh, I mean, well, they may well be, but you know, I think there seem, seems to be, you know, there should be uh, something far more formal uh, than well, well, whatever it is you've got, because um, it's clearly not working, and um, we've got a wide rate, a wide disparity of figures. Um, best practice um, isn't isn't being shared and should be, because uh, we need to get these figures down. Okay, Sean, very briefly, and then I'm going to... Thank you. Um, I would probably disagree with you in terms of, of us not sharing best practice because that's very much a feature of the group. And what we tried to express in the submission that we've shared with um, committee today is that there is a commonality across councils in terms of the different approaches. Um, we are all broadly doing very much the same thing. Um, we are looking at our policy interventions, tweaking them where they need to be tweaked, but re recognising and realising that poli policy interventions alone um, are not going to solve the problem. And it's very much about application and practice in councils. And that's where we truly do learn from each other um, through the wellbeing group. Okay, thank you very much for that. Kenny? Hi, thanks. It's just that with regard to the Society of Personnel and Development Scotland submission, what I think is significant, we've talked a lot about you know, how we deal with absenteeism, but one of the, 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 the points that, they, that, was, that, that was raised, which I found interesting, was that um, second to stress in the public sector, management style is the biggest cause of long-term absence. So I'm just wondering how that can be improved in order to from perhaps from our union colleagues as, as, as well uh, as a society uh, in order to stop people becoming ill in the first place and, uh, and not just about how we deal with people once they become ill but Drew, Drew would you like to come in at this point yeah I'll, two things I'll come back to yours uh, I think <clears throat> the trade union side have tried to have a bit of dialogue with COSLA around bringing more terms and conditions back to collective uh, national agreements. We don't have many, most 32 are separate. The problem has been when those conversations were happening, Derek Mackay controls 58% of local government budget. They're looking at it, that they're using that, those discussions, they're like, what can we cut to maybe do this? That was never our intention. We want to try and, because there are good practices and we would probably prefer, there's a lot of things we could do to have national agreements like we've got, the teachers have got and the NHS have. But local government, there isn't a lot that's discussed. Uh, there's national agreement. Sick pay is one of them. Um, but there's more, I think, we could do collectively to have more national agreements. But the problem has been, it always comes down to the, the budget for local government has been hammered so much. They have to look at that in terms of, well, if we're doing something, we've, we've got to give to take. And it's, that's not, the trade union side was never there to give something away to maybe to bring something back that was so those conversations kind of died to death if i'm honest um to come on to uh, mr gibson's point yeah i think the stress is just is just used there's a huge that, that one word covers a huge variety of different things you've got mental health work related stress personal finances is involved in that relationship issues addiction issues but all those things if somebody's off any of that just gets put to stress and it's a massive, massive issue that I think is inconsistent. Some councillors do quite well. They, they, they use um, occupational health well. Some have private councillors that they can't contact. Um, okay. And we work as much as we can. About management style. Yeah, and, and that, that brings up the point that Joanna made earlier on, but I want to bring Annabelle in first. I mean, I, I had uh, wondered the same thing because certainly speaking to people who work in the front line in my part of the country, you know, some of the stories they, they tell about how, you know, picking up some of Drew's points, what they experience on the front line, and then they go back to their manager at their local authority and they get no support at all. Uh, fill in a form, put it in the drawer. 
So I think there, there needs to be some attention focused seriously on how frontline workers are being supported. <clears throat> I wondered in terms of you know, the, the issues that all employers will face about um, people with caring responsibilities and all the rest, but I just wonder to what extent is there a, a pattern of flexible working in local authorities? Because you know, many um, uh, other organisations, both public and private, you know, have a very serious attempt to have a, a meaningful fl flexible working policy, which uh, can make the difference between people being able to actually go to their work or not. Uh, and I just wonder, I don't hear any mention of that yet this morning, as far as local authorities are concerned. So that would be <coughs> one issue. And another issue is, you know, what do solace do? I mean, I take the, the point about national collective bargaining, but, you know, not all of the issues we're talking about are necessarily within that framework. There are many other issues here. Uh, and, you know, if it is the case that Solis, you know, and chief executives of councils get together, what is it that they do then? I mean, what do they do? I don't know. Perhaps you could enlighten us. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I think... I think, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to let Nikki come in at this point. <laughs> Joanna and Alex. Um, I actually wanted to pick up the point about... Um, the, the management style and culture first because I think that is an absolutely critical part of, of this and, and the way that we are certainly viewing um, a, as our way forward in terms of a potential solution. Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier, I've only been in post since last summer, so, um, but one of the things that I'm prioritising quite significantly is investment in improving the visibility of management, and that's at all levels, but actually also equipping management with the right skills for being able to have the confidence to be able to properly support um, staff when they have some of the, so there have been a range of different circumstances have been described this morning. Um, a lot of managers are actually not uh, confident in dealing with some of these things. They actually can be very difficult things to manage and they do need support and training to develop the skills to be able to, do, to effectively manage those situations. So Stuart mentioned earlier, we're investing in leadership development in the council, but with a particular focus on certain aspects, which include maximising attendance and managing change, because we are finding that we are in, in local government within this constant cycle of change now. Um, don't particularly see that going away and it, it, it is giving different issues for us in terms of, Stuart mentioned one significant one there in terms of the management layer changing or, or the roles of managers changing. So there's a need to make sure that the people that are in those posts then are actually equipped to be the, to carry out the supportive functions that are required. Um, so, I mean, the, the culture, the cultural aspect as well is, is really important and that is something that is not it's not an easy thing to fix. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. It's, it needs many different actions in terms of being able to um, sort of get to the positive empowering culture that you would, you would like in the organisation. I think if you've got that sort of culture, um, and I, I would suggest we're on that journey, um, you do find that you it's a much more motivating, um, positive experience for staff coming to the work. Uh, and that is what we're aspiring to. Uh, a more medium term goal, because as I say, I don't think I'm going to be able to fix that in six months, but I think it is a big part of the solution to this. Um, just in terms of the solace comment, I'm not sure how well equipped I feel to, feel, uh, to, to speak for the other 32 <laughs> chief execs. Um, but what I would say is there's a significant work programming in solace that covers a number of policy areas. And what tends to happen is those are prioritised and, and the relevant policy boards are set up to take forward the negotiations on those. I'm quite happy that, um, that I, I, certainly I know absence is something that comes up quite a lot in the discussions in the short period of time I've been engaged with Solace. So um, probably in, it comes up um, actually consistently across a number of the different policy themes that are being looked at. So I do think you tap into quite an important issue there in terms of it's maybe not being pulled out as an issue in its own right just at the moment, but it's certainly a strong theme that comes through recurrently in all of the, all of the policy debates that I've been party to. Thank you. Joanna? Yeah, thank you. I mean, very briefly on the SPDS um, forum uh, that was mentioned. I mean, I think that's all well and good, but that doesn't um, it doesn't bring our trade union colleagues uh, into those discussions. And I do, I do think there needs to be a joint forum for discussing these issues, because I have a role to play in that. And it shouldn't take the form, as Drew's uh, dis already described, of having a discussion about what to cut. Um, because I think going on to the, the wider point that's been made about management style, this is a really significant 
significant issue. Um, and the biggest factor in driving the management style at the moment is uh, change management and the amount of change that local authorities are being asked to undertake. And that is driven by um, cuts to budgets. Um, it's been driven by the, the um, reducing amount of their budget that they now have control over. Um, and, and what that means, means has meant in recent years is constant change within local authorities. The number of meetings that myself and, and Drew and other trade union colleagues face at the moment is at the meetings that we go to where we're discussing reorganisations of departments where you're deleting X number of posts, where managers are taking on more individuals to manage, where their workflow is changing, they're taking on additional responsibilities. And the, and the pressure that puts on the workforce is one which causes uh, stress, um, which causes um, things to be deprioritised um, in favour of delivering uh, additional work. And the things that are deprioritised are things like management training which they need in order to feel confident and capable of delivering as managers for the people that they support. Um, you, you talked earlier on about the Glasgow example where yep. things changed overnight basically. I mean that's kind of the point you made right uh, and that was just about a change of attitude. That doesn't take a lot of expensive training meetings to go to see that your attitude should be person focused mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of figure focused. Should yeah. Nice so I mean, so first I'd say it didn't change overnight, you but know, but it, it was, years, there was there was a change in tone. Um, now that doesn't take huge amounts of training, but it does take leadership, um, and um, you know. Leadership is impacted by the degree of change as well. One thing that I would say about the Glasgow example is that the, the, the words on the policy itself didn't change dramatically. The engagement of staff did. The culture in respect of the policy being applied as a supportive mechanism rather than a punitive mechanism did. Yes, absolutely. Um, but. I mean, I think I would say, though, I'd go back to the point that has been made previously. You cannot take 15,000 people out of the workforce over a period of five years and not expect that to impact on management style, uh, organisational change, um, and, and the pressure that individuals feel in, in doing their jobs. And back to the Glasgow example, no local authority will, will have seen a change in staff any more than Glasgow has. Um, no, absolutely. I'm not saying it's the only thing, but certainly, you know, and, and I'm also not saying that Glasgow is now perfect. What I'm saying is that there was... Um, even, even that there I'm was, not trying to say that. <laughs> um, that I'm sure my colleagues in the Glasgow City branch would, uh, would uh, have something to say if I did. But um, no, it's not perfect. What I'm saying is there was a change in culture. Um, culture change is driven by leadership style. Um, and you do find that our leaders in local authorities are under pressure because of cuts to their budgets. So you haven't seen the Glasgow example replicated um, in, in many other places. People are struggling at the moment to deal with many of these issues. And that's why things like flexible working policies, whilst we advocate those, and they do exist in many areas, one of the first things to go when people are under pressure is that bit of flexibility for somebody to leave that bit earlier, to pick up their, their kids or to look after their elderly parent. Those are the first things that, that go when people are stretched. It's not a question of it, it you know, the, the key thing about flexible working is that it's not to be a sort of largesse on the part of the employer, it's to be a right and entitlement on the part of the employees. So I'm Absolutely. not talking about a discretionary, oh, you can go home at two o'clock thing. I'm talking about it being built into the employment practices of the relevant organisation. That's what seems to be missing. Yes, uh, I, I, and I would agree with you. Um, I, but discretion is the first thing that, that goes, and whilst it shouldn't be uh, at the whim of a manager's discretion, it very often is, um, and that's our experience on the ground. Um, so we would advocate greater flexibility. It does help, it does support people in their workplace, but these things are pressured because of cuts to budgets. Hey, thank you, hey, Alec. We've, we've talked about the culture and the engagement that you're all doing in, in your management roles uh, within the organisations. Uh, I had, like many, I had the privilege of being a councillor myself for 18 years in Perth and Kinross, uh, and we looked at not just what's happening in local authorities, we went out to the private sector uh, and looked at some of the large employers uh, within the community. Uh, for example, uh, Scottish and Southern Energy or Aviva, uh, 
when, when we talked to them about what they were doing and how they were managing the resource themselves to see what, if there was any lessons could be learned uh, from the private sector. Can I ask about what you're doing within that role? Have you similar experiences to that? And are you using that as a, as a forum to try and manage that change in culture and the change in management styles that you're all dealing with? Take it that was aimed at you, Nikki. It certainly was leading <laughs> in your direction. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take that. I think um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, I was just reflecting with colleagues prior to coming into the committee this morning. Actually, even personal experiences of, pri of private sector, because um, what you see are perhaps more... Um, more flexibility in some of the, the way the policies are deployed too. So one of the examples I was just discussing with colleagues was um, one from the financial sector where um, one of the, 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 this particular company, it's a large company, I won't name them, um, who had particular issues with sickness absence, but also because of their understanding of the situation and the, the, the factors for the um, underlying absences, had realised that they were having a number of short-term absences arising because of care responsibilities or domestic emergencies, these sorts of things. So they introduced um, a, a specific um, leave entitlement around um, caring responsibilities. It's why, why we're we're looking at one of that, that particular area because we think that we've also got that issue where you, you find that we were just talking about, you know, you wake up in the morning, there's a pressing domestic emergency, be it either from a caring responsibility, childcare or, or something else of that ilk. Um, and they created an allowance. I think it was something like five days per annum. It, it was um, something that was at managerial discretion, but actually uh, uh, what the, that organisation found was it had a dramatic impact on their sickness absence levels because staff knew that they had a good go-to place in terms of those sorts of emergencies that meant that they didn't have to use um, sickness absence or annual leave as the automatic panacea for, for that particular emergency. Okay, thank you. Sean, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just, just a couple of things on um, a few of the points that have just been made. In relation to family-friendly policies, I think they are very well embedded across councils. Um, I think research would show that if we pulled that information in, that you know, there's a suite of family-friendly provisions across all councils. They may be very sort of slightly different in their nuances, but the broad principles of them will be the same. Where the issue may be is, is in the application of the family-friendly policy, and this perhaps comes back to Joanna's point. You know, we have seen changes in councils over the years, and councils have become smaller in terms of the, their employment status, that there are fewer people working for local government now. Layers have been taken out at a management level and at a supervisory level. So the, the, the needs of the, the new manager, the new supervisor, are, are quite different to, to what was there before. And there is an emphasis now in councils on building confidence at that level to have the conversations with individuals and to develop the relationship with the people they manage. So that in times of crisis where they, they need an, a, a, an extra support, they don't revert to sickness absence to, to cover a caring responsibility. They have that upfront conversation with their manager and the manager feels equipped because they understand the, the, the empowered role that they have. They do exercise discretion and give them that, that leeway, if you like. It's difficult, Joanna, because so much of that workforce has gone now and we have a, a whole cohort of new managers, new supervisors, who are both learning their, you know, their professional area of work and also developing their management area of work. And we are trying really hard across councils to bolster um, those managers to be more confident in how they, they carry out those conversations with individuals. OK, it does seem as if there's still a fair bit of work to be done on that. Can I just ask a question, Dave? The health and social care integration has been mentioned to us as a possible uh, factor for an increase in sickness rates. Has anybody got any evidence or comments to make on that? And if it is the case, why? Okay. Um, we, I think you need to think about um, the services that are in scope within the health and social care partnership. So it's, it's in those traditional sectors where there's a lot of manual lifting, handling or 24-7 type um, shift arrangements for, for the staff involved. So typically they have had higher absence rates. So that would have been the same irrespective of it being within the council or within the health and social care partnership. 
Having said that, we've had a particular issue within Clap Manager where there was there were high um, sickness absence levels, um, particularly in the staff group that were that transfer well didn't transfer but, um, that are, are um, delivering services on behalf of the health and social care partnership. Um, we have actually supported the staff who are the management within the health and social care partnership, and actually by it's this proper deployment of policies by getting the support to properly deploy the policies they've had a significant success in bringing down the sickness absence but it, it actually requires all the things that we've been talking about this morning that you know it's it's not about taking a punitive approach it's about getting the understanding and having the right managerial approach to deal with that because these are very demanding roles that people are carrying out in these particular um areas of service delivery okay thank you does anybody else have any comments on that one uh, if I use an example from Dundee City Council, they used to have um, managers dealing, predominantly where a manager was dealing with sickness absence, it was long term in particular, but just any serious stuff, there would always be a manager in HR. There's no, no longer an HR presence at any of these meetings now, it's all just done by the phone. So that support for that manager has changed. The, the kind of knowledge, expertise of the management has changed dramatically over the years because most of the ones that have the 10, 20, 30 years experience have taken packages to go and retire through restructuring. So there is a large group of new managers in place. And then in the same council this week, you may have seen some of the press, they're looking at home carers having to start doing split shifts. So one of our home carers, who's a single mum, had to say to the councillors on Monday night, with well, this proposal, I'll my daughter, well, I'll have to find childcare for my daughter 144 nights a year, as opposed to the moment I don't have to do any, because I can work around it. How are we going to do it? How, how am I going to fit around that? It's going to either cost me money, and the council's answer is, well, you could reduce your working, hour, your working hours, so she'll lose three grand, £3,000 a year. So that's the option she faces. So, and there's no possibility of flexible working because the, the, the staff force has been cut. They've only got the bare core. Yes, she can ask for flexible working, but business needs will be, we can't, uh, sorry about that, but we can't accommodate, or we can cut your hours. So then she's left with that choice. So that's within, I would imagine those kind of issues are, are, are mirrored across health and social care. I'm just using Dundee as the most recent example. Okay, I'm sure they'll be delighted. Thank you. <laughs> Another way to look at this, I mean, it, there's many, many issues involved and we've discussed many of them, but of course in any organisation, you know, the, 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 the responsibility for management comes from the very top down. So the chief executive, all the directors, all pretty well remunerated, and then the managers and so forth. So one of my question is, it's as if, you know, there's nothing to be done. Well, there's lots of things to be done that can improve the management, starting from the chief executive taking more responsibility for this. Is that something people would agree with? I completely agree with that. <laughs> I, I hope that's come across actually this morning because I think that, it, uh, to me, that is a big part of this. It, if you have the right philosophy and uh, the right leadership style across the organisation, it makes a significant difference about how people feel when they're coming to the work. And actually, that getting to that place where people feel motivated and empowered within the organisation is something that we aspire to. In t you know, I'm working quite hard to establish a new management group just now. And, and these sorts of things are things that we're discussing quite a lot. And, you know, where, where you, I, I absolutely agree with the, the comments that um, union colleagues have made about, yes, there is a lot of pressure in the system, but actually we have, I, I'm very clear that in CLACs, you know, we've got a predominantly local workforce who are the staff of the council. We've got an incredibly committed bunch of people that work for the council. And I value their contribution highly, as do, do my colleagues in the management group. So we need to make sure that that's known and that's visible and we do as much as we can to support it. What I would say alongside that, though, is at the end of the day, we also have to run the business. So there is a balance to be struck. I don't say that in any way of uh, any mitigation, because I heard the comments that Drew just made, but we, we can't always do everything for everybody. But I think if you've created the right environment, um, it does it does actually go a long way towards helping people um, feel that they want to come to the work, they want to continue to make their contribution. Um, and I wouldn't want that to be ex at the expense of things like presenteeism, which we've also discussed, because that's something we've been tackling, you know, sending a few people home when they shouldn't be in the, in the, the work, when they're clearly quite ill. Thank you, Graham, uh, and then Sean, and then Kenny. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think um, the, the point's well made that management style um, can, can have an effect, uh, and I've seen this um, throughout, throughout my career 
Uh, I was actually convener once, believe it or not, a union rep uh, in a previous uh, workplace. So I've seen, I've seen, I've seen good and bad practices uh, from from managers, and it does uh, it does have an it does have an effect on uh, ab absenteeism. Um, Annabel Ewing um, asked the, the very pertinent question, what does SOLIS do? I would ask the question, what does the improvement service do? Uh, my understanding is we asked them along to this session, thinking they may have been about improving things, um, and they uh, didn't think it was appropriate to come, or, well, they're not here. Um, I just wonder what the people around the table think, um, whether they think that there is a role for them in this. John, you wanted to come in, but you yes. answer that as well. Yes, so if I perhaps try to comment on um, that particular point, and then, then I'll, I'll add the, the additional bit to, to what Nikki just said. Um, we had suggested um, to um, those who are involved in, in pooling together um, witnesses, you know, to give evidence at this committee, that the Improvement Service might have a role to, to play. And that suggestion came through from the, the Society of Personnel um, and Development. And the reason for making that suggestion was in the context of we were um, fairly clear that, you know, um, you would be looking at the, the, the recent benchmarking report, which was just published um, a couple of weeks ago. They obviously have a key role in the production of that report and in writing that report, and therefore we had thought there might be an opportunity for some questions to be directed to the improvement service in that context. And they over, obviously have the overview role as well in terms of um, working with councils to capture the, the statutory performance indicator information and to, to condense that into um, the information that you have before you. So that was the reason we had suggested um, that they perhaps could add some value to the discussion today. And one of the earlier discussions we had at this meeting, right at the very beginning, was around the, the data and how it's captured and the definition of the data and how well that is applied. So I think that would have most definitely have been an area for them to come in and comment on. So that was where the suggestion came from. You wanted to comment the previous... Okay, thank you. It was just to, to pick up on what um, Nikki was saying and to the commitment that's there through SOLAS um, in, in sort of like the, the body of the chief executives. And I think that the evidence that we have as councils and speaking on behalf of councils um, who are around the table as well as those who are not, is that there is a strong um, strategic um, commitment from chief executives. They really do value the importance um, and the benefits of a healthy organisation and they push that down into the organisation and some of that is directed at HR um, to take a lead on, and some of that is just directed at the organisation as a whole, at managers, at leaders, um, to, to cascade and embed that in, into the organisation. What we are striving to do is to, to ensure managers act as good role models. Um, and we're, we're all doing that with different, um, different approaches, but with a great degree of, of commonality as well, um, so that workplace culture um, good workplace culture is respected and valued as something that, that should be embedded into the organisation alongside work-life balance for everyone, no matter what job they do and no matter what level they're at in the organisation. Um, but there's a, a great role there um, to ensure that line managers are aware that supporting, supporting employees in that regard, health and well-being is a key part of the job that they do. And we need to encourage managers to recognise and to seek support if it's not being offered when they recognise that they do have competency issues in that space so that we can find ways to support them. So, I mean, that probably picks up on a few comments. Um, I'm not saying we have all the answers, but we do recognise that it's a strategic imperative to turn the absence figures around. Um, and our focus is definitely on embedding that into the organisation through, through good health and wellbeing practices. Okay, thank you. Kenny, you wanted to come up? Yes, Convener, we've talked about best practice in terms of local authorities sharing, you know, um, w w what they do well with other local authorities, but I'm just wondering what local authorities do within their own organisations to share best practice, because I remember many years ago when it was an education committee, we, we, we uh, did some work and we noticed that the, the difference in terms of educational attainment between departments within the same school was often much wider than it was from school to school or even from authority to authority. So. If, if, if our local authority colleagues here have an issue with a particular department, for example, say absenteeism is a bit higher than others, how would you tackle something like that um, specifically? Because you may have a different work culture in one 
area of the local authority relative, for example, to the others, and it's how you actually change the culture within a specific department to, to be able to, um, you know, uh, impact positively on the whole. I think that's a really good question because I actually don't think there's a single solution. I think it depends very much on the set of circumstances that you're looking at. So I can give you a couple of examples from CLACS. Um, we had um, an increase or an, a continuing increase within, it, it happened to be the housing service over a period of time. And um, had had, I had had several discussions with the, the then head of service about that. They were deploying all the policies in his view, effectively, they were trying to, to make all the correct interventions. So what we actually did was we looked externally and we, uh, we had um, some external um, experts look at a selection of cases to look at the interventions that could have made it be made at different point, points and actually what their conclusions demonstrated and this all came back into our senior team so that we corporately were all reviewing this and so the opportunity for obviously shared learning on that too but the very clear message that came back was probably a lack of confidence amongst some of the managers within that service to be able to de deploy the right interventions at the right points um, re relative to the particular cases that had been looked at. So that was one example where we took that particular um, um, intervention. What actually happened as a consequence of that was that learning was taken back into the service and absence in that service has improved considerably relative to um, other sections within the council now. Um, another example is within um, our development and environment um, set of services. You'll appreciate that's a, a large collection of sort of discrete, um, discrete services that are provided from there. That one of the issues there has, has actually been to do with change and organisational redesign where we have a number of managerial vacancies and what we're finding is more junior staff and are needing to actually step up and take responsibility for the sort of things that perhaps more senior or experienced <coughs> managers have done in the past. So what the um, director has done in that case is he has <coughs> convened um, or, or created a, an extension to his regular engagements with trade union and, and the managers and they actually look in more detail at some of the reasons for absence. So what he's trying to do is work um, in partnership with trade union colleagues to look at how they can manage those absences across the service. I mean, we're very conscious that trade union colleagues can be incredibly helpful, particularly in areas like development and environment, uh, where there's a high membership, um, to um, reinforce some of the, the um, policy pra and practice that we want to see, even if it's away from absence, including things like health and safety, another very important theme in that area. So there are different approaches, I think, that you can take depending on the particular issues that you're looking at. And I, that, those are just a couple of examples for us. Okay. Uh, Joanna and then Andy. Yeah, it was just specifically on, on that point. Um, I think there is a, a huge role for the trade unions to play um, within councils in terms of um, understanding the differences that exist and perhaps helping to address them. And the reason for that is because we very often spot trends uh, within councils um, sooner than uh, the local authorities themselves. And the, and the reason for that is because we tend to get more members coming to us seeking support at attendance review meetings or disciplinary um, meetings. So we can see the numbers going up and we can see the departments uh, that it's taking place in and we can spot trends uh, in in approach and um, so very often we will either have conversations with uh, managers in those departments uh, or with HR and or raise that more formally where it's appropriate to do so um, and that is about trying to ensure that there is support and um, to ensure that the uh, culture is a supportive one and that where we see uh, managers are needing a bit of training or development that that is provided to them. Yeah, thank you. Andy you want to come on? Uh, thanks committee yes. <clears throat> I just want to follow up this question about uh, management because it's been observed by the Improvement Service that some councils, um, their HR services are still very corporate and um, uh, uh, provide a, a central function, uh, whereas others, uh, the HR function has been rolled out to, to managers more. And I'm wondering if that matters um, or if that's a recent trend uh, and what impact it might have had. Michelle? I think that does matter. 
Um, I think if you look across councils, and I know that you have a range of um, data before you today showing the picture across councils um, over the years in terms of their ups and downs in relation to the reported figures, I think evidence would show that where a more concentrated effort is in place through HR, generally speaking, absence levels um, will, be, will be lower. Um, and where that support is not in place, I think, again, generally, um, absence levels will tend to be higher. And I think that's, um, that's also, that also emphasises the need for us to ensure that where that concentrated HR support is not in place, we need then to ensure that the managers who are charged with um, managing absence and, and, and doing much more of it on their own without you know, that, that dedicated support are equipped to do so, that they're skilled, that they're com competent, that they understand the importance of that relationship um, between them and the person who is suffering um, from an illness or a particular condition. So I think, you know, I think, I don't think there's ever been a, a fully worked through a piece of research on that, but I think anecdotally, if you went across councils, you would find that that was the picture. And I think trade unions might also um, support that particular position. Paul, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I suppose just in terms of my experience, I mean, obviously working in East Ayrshire now, but I've worked in larger councils. I mean, the size of East Ayrshire Council, you know, in terms of the whole corporate mass in terms of the employees, could be the size of a, of a service, for example, Glasgow, but in the larger local authorities. Uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, we have a, a corporate HR function that services the council. Uh, that does provide me with the opportunity to make, to make sure that we do have, as far as possible, a consistency of practice uh, and not having to pull in outlying managers or HR professionals to ensure uh, that our policies are being implemented correctly. Uh, I think from that model for me works in that we can allocate resources uh, to service areas we talked about demands and, and peaks and maybe uh, issues in particular services. So I have at my disposal resources that I can uh, allocate to, to look at particular interventions in particular areas, and that's because I have uh, a central or a corporate HR function. Uh, and certainly for my authority, you know, you know, I would argue that works well. Uh, it may not be the case where we have much larger authorities. Okay. Hey, Stuart, you wanted to come in. Yes, thanks, Chair. I mean, uh, for me, there are kind of some basic hygiene factors that uh, are actually uh, quite important uh, beyond perhaps sort of some of the more sort of, uh, leadership development processes. I mean, for uh, in my role as a director, uh, more often, you know, quite often I'll be the person that's chairing the, the capability hearing or the, or the disciplinary hearing. And quite often when... Yeah, you're sitting there and you're listening to the evidence for, 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 for both parties. What fundamentally you know, comes back, you think to yourself, a couple of years ago, a conversation could have stopped this at source. It could have stopped. And to me, a lot of it comes back time and time again to actually having a relationship with the, with the employees and having systematic processes in place so that you can actually have dialogue and discussions. And I know it seems really simple and straightforward, but quite often... The relationships are actually, and having that that relationship, uh, is fundamental. And it's, it's just basic things: is does the employee and are, do they have a performance review and development meeting at least once a year? Do they understand how they fit within the context of the organisation? Does the organisation uh, uh, value their place uh, within uh, that whatever, irrespective of their role? Do they know who you are as the manager? Do they know? Do they know where to come? they know that at least on a monthly basis they're going to have a one-to-one -one discussion with you so you can actually resolve a a any issues. So, you know, I have monthly meetings with, uh, with, with my managers. Um, the first item on the agenda is always outturns and budgets and, <laughs> and savings. That's just the, the way of the world. But the second, the second item on the agenda is, is attendance. Uh, and we have discussions uh, about a... Um, uh, uh, how attendance is managed. I know every case within my directorate uh, in terms of the long term, and I know that the, uh, whether the triggers have been uh, met and what support mechanisms are, are in place. Uh, and you have to actually ensure, it's a wee bit like the Plan Do Check Act. You know, you actually have to check that your managers are actually doing the, doing the basics. Uh, so 
I, I do think b beyond lots of the things that we're doing, and I think in club manager four years ago, if you asked me, did, did we have the right suite of policies were they in line with best practice? I would have said no. I think now we're getting there, but we've still got lessons to learn. We're deploying uh, lots of those now. But there is an element in just making sure that things are getting done, the basics are getting done, that there's basic relationships there. And that's actually a role of a manager to actually check that that's happening. And the employee has a, a safe place to go if they're having an, having an issue and you can resolve it early. And did you want to come back on? Uh, no, that's quite interesting. I mean, the, 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 the other thing, you, you talked about relationships. I'm just wondering, councils are still quite traditional hierarchical places with managers and bosses and employees and, uh, and the rest of it. I mean, there's, is there any experience of doing work differently? I mean, if you look at the private sector, if you look at co-ops and mutuals and employee-owned companies, um, they have much better work satisfaction, they have much letter, less absenteeism, etc. Are there different ways of people working in services that can help to reduce absenteeism? Stuart. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think, I think Nikki alluded to it and, and perhaps by others. I think there's an element of visibility. I mean, I remember years ago um, uh, when I first started working in uh, local government, the directors were gods. You didn't go anywhere near uh, the director's office. They were absolute gods. They were they were had a, a wall of <laughs> PAs around them, and you didn't get anywhere. Near. I think now, uh, as a director, I think it's a completely <laughs> different culture. Uh, people uh, are generally expect you to be more approachable, but I think there are things that you can do, making sure that you're available, that your doors open. Uh, that you actually go round the office and say hello to people uh, and engage with them and, and ensure that your managers uh, are doing that as well. I don't think it's actually rocket science. I get, again, I would just come back to it. It's about, uh, it's about relationships uh, and, and actually being human. We've all suffered bereavements. We've all you know, gone uh, through various life events and it's actually just understanding uh, that, that when it comes to your turn that you expect to be treated uh, in the same way as uh, uh, that you would treat others. Paul, you wanted to come in and ask Come back to Stuart's point, and there's a part of that relationship or that conversation that I think we really do need to promote, and that's about you know making sure our employees know it's okay to talk to the managers. And again, sometimes I think we we have cultures where oh, I can't talk to my managers about that. So you know we need to embed that within organisations, and that's a two two way conversation. Uh, I think that the part about in terms of doing things differently. You know, certainly, you know, I would like to think, and we're looking at this in small pockets of our council now, that by empowering our workforce more, you know, there is a bigger sense of ownership, there's a bigger sense of uh, commitment, you know, and I think with that, you know, comes a, a much better employee manager council relationship uh, and that's ultimately about how we respond to our communities and we're trying to roll some of those models out uh, into that if people you know and i'm not suggesting employees don't because we have a very hard working and committed employee if we can push that a bit further to say you know you are absolutely embedded in what's happening within your communities you are critical to the success of your communities you are valued within your communities i think that will very much add to embedding that culture of value and i think we do need to to push that uh, as far as we can to make sure people understand. There is a sense, and we, we look at this in terms of the developing a wellbeing culture, that uh, I think for employees, managers, trade unions as all, well, there's a tendency sometimes you leave your home person at home <coughs> and there's a different being comes into the workplace. And we all are, I would hope to think, I like to think, caring the employees or people, we've got husband, wife, partners, kids. We do that at home. Sometimes we leave it at home so you know if we treat each other the way we would treat you know your own family friends siblings eh, i think that would embed some of that well-being culture and it's about changing thank you Nikki. i just want to add in respect to mr whiteman's comment um i think part of the management role <coughs> is to create the space for that creativity those different things to happen and i don't think that traditional local government structures have, have been the place for that. I think that's changing. So I, I, I think my experience just now is with things that I'm looking at, that actually it needs a little bit of investment before perhaps um, staff feel comfortable in that space or feel that it's okay to come up with different ways of doing things. 
Um, so that there, I, I'm going through, a, I actually want to create a, a forum of kind of more middle tier managers that was around promoting change, about empowering the managers to be part of the leadership of the organisation. But actually what we found is that the skills aren't consistently there to be able to engage in that discussion. So we're investing in that first to create the capacity so that they can actually fully participate in that. And I think it doesn't matter what grade you are in the organisation, I think those principles are probably something that we'll keep coming back to. But I think there needs to be the management will to create that space in the first place. Okay, Joanna. Back on that and, and something that Stuart said earlier about the relationship between the employee and their manager it is absolutely crucial and, and Stuart's right when he says that some of the fundamentals need to be there, regular dialogue and um, performance uh, review discussions, one-to-one um, -one meetings etc. I mean one thing that I would impress on the committee is, is this, that these things are all very well if you're talking about a workforce that works in an office, um, you know there's, you, you pass your manager's desk on a daily basis, you say hello, all the rest of it. Um, a huge number of members that we represent are, are the types of people that Drew mentioned earlier who are on split shifts, who are out on the front line, care workers who receive text messages to tell them where to, to go and visit. Um, that's not a text message telling you where to go is not a relationship with your manager. These individuals very often don't see their managers for days and weeks on end. Um, something about that nature of that work has to change in order to ensure that there is that space and time created in the employment relationship to have that sort of dialogue. Um, so some areas do it better than others, but there is, an, there is an issue about the nature of some of the work, is what I would say. So that has to be a consideration. OK, thank you for that. Graham? Yeah, um, I, I, I want to, I've got, I've got a substantive question, but I, I just want to double check something that Joanna said right at the start, because I didn't quite catch it. You were, you were um, talking about you'd done FOIs uh, across councils, uh, and some of them didn't keep the information, but I didn't quite pick up what, what it was about. Yep. So, um, this is in relation to if you um, uh, ask for freedom of information requests from councils as to how many staff have been taken through absent management procedures. So that's where they've gone through trigger processes and they've had absence management discussions or, and or a punitive intervention such as disciplinary um, hearings as a result of their absence. So a significant number of councils claim they do not hold a figure on how many members of staff have been taken through absent management processes. And the, the ones that I specifically mentioned were Midlothian, Aberdeenshire, Argyll and Butte and West and Bartonshire. Okay. I think that's that, that's a concern um, if, if there are councils that don't hold that information because yeah. they certainly should hold that information. Yeah. And, and I, I would assume that that information would exist somewhere but they claim it's not held centrally. So that, that to me would say that the HR department is not collating that information. It would certainly have to be held, I would assume, by line managers and departmental managers, for example. I, I, I find it surprising that councils... HR departments are not holding that centrally. I, I, see Ms. I see Mr Duffy's keen to come in. I've got another question, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. I think just to give an example of Aberdeenshire as well, we had an almost dispute with them just now about the PSAs I was talking about, the people's supports. So of the number of accident reports that our members and staff have submitted, we asked Aberdeenshire, what's the breakdown of that? What, what are they? And they said, we don't know. And it would cost us, and they've said, £1,800 to find that out. So they've refused our request because they've said that's too much. Now, we are in the, this, is, this is people's health and safety we're talking about. People are being bit, spatched. £1,800 in a council is not unreasonable. But that's, so that backs, the, 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 some are very reluctant to share some of this. And it's, it's helpful for, for us to hear this but today. That, yeah, it is really helpful. Um, my, main qu my other question is there's a big difference between the, the absence rates for teachers uh, which is running a, on average about six days a year, and non-teachers, which is just over 11 days a year. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? Because a big difference. I cannot comment on um, what's happening within the teaching um, profession because obviously we don't represent uh, teachers. However, I would go back to the point that I made just earlier, which is about the nature of work um, uh, and the 
the nature of the work that some of our members is doing uh, is right on the front line. Um, out in the field on a daily basis, split shift. Many of our members actually have multiple contracts of employment uh, with their local authorities. So they'll be contracted to do perhaps 12 hours as a home care worker and perhaps eight hours as a cleaner in a local school, for example. So, you know, if you only looked at the numbers who are um, contracted as uh, cleaners in schools um, or as home carers, again, you would get uh, a misrepresentation of what's happening on the ground because it doesn't take into consideration that some of those people are doing both of the, those jobs um, on a daily and weekly basis. So there's an issue about, I think, the nature of, of work um, and some of the different pressures that exist within council staff that we've rehearsed earlier in, in the session. Uh, there was a comment earlier in relation to, uh, to teachers' absence, and I made the point that, that teachers' absence um, was increasing. I know it's not increasing in, in terms of the figures that are reported, but the feedback that is coming through from the teaching trade unions is that there is more evidence of um, stress, anxiety, um, workload pressures within schools. And the teaching trade unions, the EIS in particular, I think have done a survey similar to some of the, the other councils, uh, the other trade unions rather, who are represented around the table. And I think they will be pr bringing their evidence to the table quite soon to show that there is a a slow creep in teachers' absence. It might not be showing a reported um, increase in absence in terms of the SPI itself, but you know, as well as PSAs and everyone else who works in a school, there is a sense that there, there is a, a lot of pressure in schools just now, and that may ultimately result in some increases in teacher absence. But at the moment, picking up on some of the points from the trade unions as well, there is a degree of presenteeism and, and people not necessarily taking time out of the system, but I think it's something to watch. What do you mean by that, presenteeism? Presenteeism is when people who are feeling under par, under the weather in terms of their health, turn up for work because they, they sometimes feel the consequences of not being at work or they feel they don't or are un unable to report as sick. Sense of duty as well. Some people just don't take time off work. Yeah, but, uh, but, but why would it be... This is no criticism of anybody, but what, I, I, I'm not sure that that uh, explains the difference. And two things I would say about that. Surely most of the workers have got a sense of that sense of duty and sense of responsibility to, to get to their work. Uh, and the other is that if the figures that we've got are not actually telling us the facts, you're saying anecdotally that you're hearing that there's more teachers off, then what are the point of the figures we've got? I'm not saying anecdotally I am hearing that more teachers are off. What I'm hearing is that more teachers are struggling from the pressures of work. Chan was that uh, you're hearing that the figures are higher than what we've got here. That's what you said. No. Well, I'm sorry if that's, if that's how it came across. What I am saying is that within the teaching workforce, there is being reported nationally through predominantly the teaching trade unions that there is a growing pressure within schools. Teachers are coping with um, additional workloads, um, the pressures of um, some of the situations that they're in. Violence and aggression has been previously mentioned in relation to PSAs. There's more reported incidents of violence and aggression in relation to teachers. And that's not always following through in teacher absences. Um, whereas perhaps in local government, you're, you're seeing a higher presence of that. Within the reported SPI figures that we've got for 17-18, um, although the figures are, are, are good in relation to teachers on a comparative scale compared to local government workers, 15 out of the 32 councils did report a slight increase in teachers' absences. So that's, you know, that's not more than half, but it's still a significant number and something perhaps to pay attention to. It still leaves a huge gap between mm -hmm. teachers and non-teaching, and I mean, that's a point that I think that Graham is, is trying to get to. Well, that, that, that's right. right, and Sharon, you, you use the word um, presenteeism, um, and you seem to be suggesting that teachers perhaps have a different attitude towards taking time off than non-teachers. That, that was the implication of what you were saying. What I was trying to do was to perhaps explain to you why there is such a gap. I don't know if that's the answer, but perhaps it could be 
um, because there is quite a stark difference in the figures and yet you know it's a, it's a local government workforce that we're talking about and dealing with so I don't know if that's perhaps an underlying reason um, in terms of the difference in figures it might be something um, that is worth exploring but I do know that outside of the context of the reported figures through the teaching trade unions there is much being reported on the pressures existing in schools around those areas I have already mentioned. Thank you. Stuart? I don't know if I've necessarily got an answer, but when we, when we, we look at our teaching age profile, uh, non-teaching age profile, it's predominantly 45 to 59. But when we look at our, uh, our teacher age profile, it's predominantly below the age of 44. So there is quite a marked difference in terms of the age profile. That's very helpful. Joanna, you want to come in? Just come back on the, on, briefly on the point about presenteeism. Presenteeism exists within the non-teaching local government workforce as well. I don't believe that that explains the difference at all. I think it is much more um, to do with demographics and the nature of work in terms of um, people having a, a static place of work, um, more regularised hours, uh, less short-term short contracts, for example. Do you want to come in? I think you're comparing two very different groups of people. If you took out teaching staff of local government, predominantly then local government workers are low paid, part time. Um, and I've gave some examples of how those workers don't feel valued um, as much as, say, the teaching staff. And there is sometimes a bit of a conflict between the two groups of workers, even though they have the same employer, I think. So that's pretty much well known. So. Um, they have sometimes more favourable terms and conditions as well. So that creates a conflict within, even within the, own, the, sim, the same workplace. Yeah, thank you, Kenny. You wanted to yeah, uh, uh, you, you call trade union colleagues. I mean, first of all, the, the, the figures that we have from space of the local government benchmarking framework, they're not anecdotal, but the, the teachers, uh, you, you know, my wife was a teacher for 23 years, do have security of employment once they actually have a, a permanent uh, contract. So I think that may make a, a significant uh, difference in that. But I think one of the things in terms of general figures with regard to um, the wider uh, local government workforce is that we don't have breakdowns per four departments to see you know, what the difference, for example, is with, say, uh, you know, care workers as opposed to those who work in housing or, or, or libraries, whatever it happens to be. And I think that would be quite useful because then we would see more of where the pressures truly lie in terms of uh, individual uh, workers and what they, they face. Okay, thank you. Annabelle? Yes. To say briefly, I mean, picking up on, on all these points, I, I think we still get back to the fundamental point, which is that even looking simply at the non-teacher and school-related uh, stats, um, on the basis that it has been accepted that local authorities go about the collation of this in different ways, notwithstanding there being some overarching policy that's supposed to be followed, the application of that is clearly different, uh, as we've heard even as between um, East Ayrshire and, and Clark. So, um, you know, I, I just have a wee bit of a reservation about reaching too many conclusions on the basis of statistics that are not necessarily collated on exactly the same basis from a statistical point of view. And that then begs the question, how would the teacher stats be collected in terms of any comparison being worthy of its salt as between teaching and non-teaching staff? And the last point I'd make is simply this. Which, you know, I think there needs to be a far greater impetus on the part of Solis and COSLA on, you know, addressing some of these issues because we're talking about people's lives and, you know, things could be done, notwithstanding budget issues. And I can say to Drew, well, you know, the Scottish Government budget's been slashed by two billions in 2010. We can have that stale budget discussion if you want. But the bottom line is here, a lot can be done now. And I just feel there's just this kind of drift going on and it's somebody else's and there's this person saying, these are the best practice principles, but actually things could be done. Uh, and I hope that instead of, you know, so this working across, you know, however many work streams with this as a kind of element of the issue being looked at, why don't you make this a, the issue and have a particular focus on this? Because then you could immediately make differences to the working lives of so many thousands of people uh, across Scotland. Over to you, Nikki. <laughs> uh, two comments, please, Chair, if I may. Um, Firstly, in terms of Mr Gibson's comment, um, 
Uh, your comment about getting into the detail of the individual service areas, I think, is absolutely spot on. That's actually the way that we, we use that as a can opener for looking at trying to understand the reasons for absence and then think about what the strategies for dealing with it might be. So I think I think that point is really important. In terms of solace, I apologise if I've, I've underplayed the work that SOLAS has done, because I know that it's been a significant theme over a long number of years. Um, I'm just thinking about the policy uh, priorities that are there just now. It's probably a recurrent theme, but I'm very happy to take that message back through SOLAS on, uh, and reflect on the experience with the committee. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd, I really want to just back up what Annabel Ewing's uh, just said, really, because uh, over the years, I think this, this, this whole issue is just, it's almost been an acceptance in local government that these are the figures. And yeah, it's almost like a collective shrug of the shoulders from councils that yeah, we'll do what we can, but you know, that's that's the way it is. And as Annabelle said, if you tackle it, you improve lives. If you if you if you tackle it, um, you can well, save money. Yeah, but I, you know, you don't you're not having to employ people to fill the gaps. That then has an impact on, on stress of the existing workforce. It really should be a priority, and it never has been. And that's why we're having this session. Exactly. OK, so Dishan, do you want to come in? I, I would probably just like to reaffirm that it's an absolute priority for councils in terms of um, a range of priorities that they, they are challenged with. Um, it's been on the agenda for many, many years, as, as Mr Simpson says. Um, and it's not a shrug of the shoulders when um, we look at what the, you know, the outcome is. Um, we're very, very focused on improving um, our attendance levels, but also very focused on um, helping improve the, the health and the well-being of our of our workforce. So, um, I know the figures perhaps don't um, don't evidence um, that, but despite very many, very many best efforts, um, you know, those are the figures. But you know, there's an awful lot of work goes on in councils. Um, on all of the things that we've been talking about um, to, to support that position. Okay, thank you. Nikki? Um, I just wanted to um, mention two things. The first is that Solace took the lead, you might remember, not that many years ago in terms of doing considerable amount of work to to refine the approach to performance information across Scotland, across the Scottish local authorities. So that work was led by Ronnie Hines when he was chair of, of the SOLAS branch. Um, this, I think a lot of the issues that have come up today about the comparability of the measures, I think that that would be something that would usefully be explored in the same way as, as a kind of further refinement of, the, of that original work. Um, I completely agree with Mr Simpson's comments about the value of sickness absence and I think one of the things that I was really keen to stress to the committee today is from CLAC's point of view, we are this is a huge priority for us because we recognise where we sit in, in the, um, the performance table. But it's not just because of that, it's about the philosophy that I would want to promote in the council. You know, the staff resource, the people that work for the council de deliver a huge contribution locally. They need to feel like a valued part of the organisation. And, and with that comes all the things that we've been talking about this morning in terms of the requirements for support and so on. And I think the benefit that we then get in return for that is exactly the point that Mr Simpson made, which is, you know, you, you've got financial benefits as well as qualitative benefit, benefits that flow through for the council and the area. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that probably brings us to a, a natural conclusion for this meeting today. So. Unless anybody's got any final important comments to make, then I'm just going to thank you for all for attending the evidence session today. The committee will discuss the evidence that's heard today in private at the next agenda item and decide any further action we might wish to take. So can I thank you all for your attendance today? That was a very useful session. Thank, thank you. you. So you'll be moving to private now as well. Yes. Uh, that concludes the public part of today's meeting and I move the meeting into private.